Thanks very much. Thanks very much for the honor of the invitation and the provocation to try to come up with, with something useful uh, to all of you. And I'm going to talk about uh, our terms, and, and I'm going to make the point that they're not, this question is not merely academic. Uh, we uh, are, I'm <clears throat> sorry about this, Rebecca, here. Yep. You have to press it quite hard, I think. Oh, oh God, sorry. Okay, this sorry. is classic. Classic. Maybe. Um, the ba I'm with the Accountability Research Center at American University, which is a startup, and we're not quite here yet. Becca? Or, or uh, Gemma? Thank you. And the Accountability Research Center is an action research incubator that launched uh, formally last September when our website went live. And the basic point of departure is that uh, the research that in the field needs to be more useful to the people who are pursuing change. After two years of consultation and exploration, uh, we, I came to the conclusion that when we're looking at the challenge of research uptake by practitioners, the main challenge is often assumed by researchers to be, well, we have to do a better job with dissemination. And I came to the conclusion that that's actually not the main problem. The main problem is really more upstream. The problem is who gets to decide what research questions get asked. And so the, uh, the, the work that we're doing really uh, is to try to broaden access to agenda setting in the field. Uh, and so the, in the process, we're questioning the thinker-doer dichotomy, which is actually a hierarchy. And so we're really uh, trying to work closely with change strategists to try to imagine what kinds of research questions would be useful to them and to try to collaborate on coming up with projects that, uh, that are really viable uh, as well as fundable as well as useful. So uh, it's obvious to all of us that democracy and accountability are on the defensive all around the world with the possible exception of Portugal and certainly Iceland. Uh, and one of the things that I don't need to tell you is that we've all underestimated the power of disinformation. And that raises the question of how do we broaden our reach by improving our ability to communicate to, to more diverse and broader constituencies what it is we're trying to do. And that's where the key words come in. One of the points of departure is that accountability is a trans-ideological term, which essentially means that it is up for grabs. That's what I mean by contested. And one of our challenges then is how do we engage in that debate by communicating the terms democratic potential more effectively? And that then raises the issue of cross-cultural communication. How do we take into account where different constituencies are coming from? And I'm going to talk a bit about the issue of language and, and translation and the distinction between conceptual and linguistic translation. And one of the implications here is that the ambiguities in this communicative process can either enable or constrain our strategies. Just a couple of examples came to mind in our own field, uh, which is when I was looking the other day for a good definition of, of offline in the context of our common terminology of online and offline participation, I realized that one of the things that all of the definitions I came across have in common is they refer to being disconnected. So and here's a residual category that has the, the implication of being disconnected. So how is it that such a term can evoke participation? And so we think we need a better term than offline when we're thinking about non-online. And the other comment I wanted to make about a term in the accountability field is that you often hear the term constructive engagement. It's promoted very heavily by uh, large institutions, particularly the, the World Bank, for example, in its work on accountability. And the implication of this term is that adversarial approaches, which don't necessarily mean throwing rocks, it could also mean contesting elections or filing lawsuits. Uh, it assumes that those approaches are inherently not constructive, which I think means essentially we'd be tying one arm behind our back. So the point of departure here is that keywords are contested, that this is not simply uh, an academic discussion, and that I want to get into the issue of the fact that we are losing those debates in many cases. Uh, and I want to draw attention for those of you uh, who are interested in the term causal stories. It's a quite useful term that refers to narratives that allow the attribution of responsibility, which is, of course, fundamental to understanding accountability. It's a term that I think we could use more. And one of the things about uh, causal stories is that they are socially and politically constructed. So here's a, a problem then, the fact that c several key terms in the field got hijacked. We start off with perhaps one of the most obvious cases, fake news, which is clearly a, an attempt to name disinformation. Yet here we have a case where the, this naming of disinformation has been successfully appropriated by the promoters of disinformation. 
We have a term very influential in the United States called drain the swamp, uh, which is associated with the fact that uh, Washington, D.C. originally was a swamp. Uh, and that gets to the question of who gets to decide what is corrupt. And of course, here's another term where the corrupt get to call others corrupt and deflect attention from their own corruption. We have the, 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 the construction and massification of fake digital civic engagement that you all know so well. And we have a very interesting recent case that fortunately has not yet been successfully hijacked where uh, policymakers in Trump's Environmental Protection Agency have proposed a new law that would essentially uh, apply open data principles to the science used to decide uh, how to and whether to regulate pollution. And, and the argument is that the only data that is fully open should be considered legitimate. What does that mean? All the research on health, the health effects of pollution, uh, should be ruled out because that data involves personal information and therefore it's, the raw data is not fully open. It's quite perverse. So, the contested terrain here uh, raises the issue of how do we learn from the experiences with the invention and circulation of keywords. And um, I've been dealing with uh, the partners of our, our little research center in the Philippines and India and Guatemala, Colombia and Mexico in particular, we've found that, that many of the terms that are very common in the global discourse can be seen as, as specialist jargon or alienating and that raises the question of, of how do we figure out which terms have a better potential to actually resonate with diverse constituencies. And so these are the terms I'm going to talk briefly about today. Some terms are well known, others are, are, are uh, in the process of being invented. And so the first one, accountability. Now, why accountability? It's well known that it's hard to translate into other languages and that has led some observers to fall into the trap of linguistic determination, determinism. And what do I mean by linguistic determinism? It means that people tend to say, well, there isn't a word for accountability in fill in the blank language and therefore the implication is that the concept does not exist. And there's a whole debate uh, about this. Uh, but what I want to say today is that the meaning of the term, the political content of the term, is also debated uh, in English as well. And, and this issue particularly has to do with who is supposed to be accountable to whom. Are we talking about upwards or downwards accountability particularly? Are we talking about the accountability of, uh, of uh, NGOs to donors? Are we talking about the accountability of governments to the World Bank? Are we talking about the accountability of citizens to the state? Or are we talking about the accountability of the powers that be to citizens? A couple of, uh, of examples from our field, the Sustainable Development Goals in the UN world are organized around national averages. And the, the, this is, implies that the theory of change is that governments will be held accountable if they don't meet those goals, but who will they be accountable to? Donors, or perhaps to the United Nations in some way. But national averages aren't exactly the most useful tools for na national and subnational organizations and constituencies to hold their own governments accountable. They need much more disaggregated, and I'll get into targeted, uh, kinds of metrics. Uh, we see uh, uh, very prominent examples of partisan bias in the prosecution of, of, uh, of corruption, the implementation of corruption laws. We see the most obvious case in Brazil most, most recently where uh, the, uh, gov governments uh, are, are essentially uh, thought, putting into practice accountability laws in a way that, that has extreme partisan bias. The, the people in Congress, the majority of the members of Congress in Brazil, as well as the current president, are uh, involved in at least as much corruption as the worst possible scenario uh, that could involve Lula. And then Colombia has another case of a very powerful inspector general who uh, the previous one, Ordonez, uh, basically removed from power over 800 mayors, including in a, a failed attempt to remove the mayor of the capital city uh, without actually having proven any charges in court. The, the basis for that move was administrative flaws. And so we have a tension between a sort of Spanish Inquisition style of accountability and uh, democratic uh, rule. And then another cl clear example in the United States involves the prison industrial complex, which is based on the, 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 the drug war, which in turn is based on hyper uh, surveillance and racially biased both laws and implementation of laws, leading to uh, an extremely dramatic uh, imbalance in terms of who's in jail. And then we have the Black Lives Matter movement that, that pushes for uh, downwards accountability in the case of uh, police violence. And we've, we've, uh, we can talk about the way in which uh, civic tech can support uh, accountability in both directions. 
Uh, but today we're going to focus on downward accountability, and I think the term public accountability helps to clarify this distinction. One a little back of the envelope uh, exercise in terms of, of linguistic determinism, I, I, I published work in Spanish on social accountability and it raises the question, how do we translate this? And uh, it, I did a little exercise to see, well, what are the terms that are used in Spanish? And they tend to not be literal translations. In, uh, in Mexico, the classic term is Contraria Social, in Colombia it would be Veeduría, there are a whole series of terms. And if you add them all up, it turns out that those terms in Spanish are more widely used than that particular term for citizen oversight in English. And if you include the most prominently used term in Spanish, Control Social, you would see the, the bar on the right would be three times as large, but I chose to exclude that because in a minority of cases that term could be used to mean social control rather than citizen oversight. So right to know is a term that uh, begins to be popularized uh, in the United States, at least with the environmental classic uh, Silent Spring. It then informs a whole wave of legislation in the United States. Uh, the term in the U.S. has to do specifically with the right to know what chemicals one is being exposed to. The Community Right to Know Act leads to, and I'm really quite curious how many are familiar with this uh, exercise of scorecard.org in the U.S., which in the early days of the internet tried to take a massive amount of, of open data that was unintelligible to citizens and convert it into a platform that would be user friendly. You just type in your zip code to find out which uh, chemicals have been uh, uh, revealed to the government to have been emitted in your neighborhood. And uh, it's a pioneering case. But one of the reasons why I'm particularly interested in the term right to know is that it implies a broader sense of what kind of, of data one needs, that a broader sense than the term transparency. Transparency is often used to focus on data that actually exists. But much of the data that citizens need to exercise their right to know may not exist because, for example, in the case of toxics, the government has decided, or not decided, to investigate exactly which chemicals are dangerous. There are tens of thousands of chemicals whose toxicity has never been studied. And so transparency wouldn't do the trick. And in India, we also have another case of the political construction of the right to know, where the, the right to information campaign popularized a slogan in Hindi that was uh, the right to know, the right to live, that was uh, reflective of their capacity to embed the right to know struggle in uh, social justice and anti-poverty programs. It involved grassroots citizens movements to uh, expose uh, corruption and the diversion of funds that were supposed to reach people. And they actually managed to, uh, through uh, both elite coalitions and grassroots pressures, develop uh, the basis for a national law that is still in place uh, in spite of the, uh, the other setbacks that, are, that uh, grassroots movements are facing in India. In Mexico, I was involved with a, uh, a grassroots organization that uh, uh, adapted the discourse to popular culture. And uh, they, in the early days of the, uh, of the, of the internet, they uh, developed their, a term to uh, describe transparency but in their grassroots organizing, but they were very concerned that in Mexico at the grassroots level, the term uh, transparencia sounds very close to grassroots slang, a word that means fraud, transa, or the verb transar. And so they played with this term to, to basically say, we, we need to go behind the appearances, tras las apariencias. This brings me to another particular transparency word, targeted transparency, which uh, refers to the use of publicly required disclosure of very specific information in a standardized and comparable format. Uh, this was first promoted by uh, Fung Graham and Wiles' book, Full Disclosure. And the, this term captured a whole series of, of policy reforms over the previous 15 years or so that integrated uh, disclosure and actionability, perceived actionability. It was really a pioneer in a user-centered approach to uh, data. And it, uh, this, the toxic release inventory that came out of the Community Right to Know Act is the paradigm case. But even uh, sort of consumer-friendly uh, terms, uh, or rather tools like nutrition labels or, or safety information, when vehicles started rolling over, they, uh, the, the, a new law basically required uh, car manufacturers to put the, the safety rating on the, uh, right, on the car, in the car lot, so that you, you could, a, a buyer of a new car couldn't avoid finding out the safety rating. And, and this is a very uh, uh, powerful term and a, and a brilliant book. But one of the puzzles of this book is that uh, while it got a lot of scholarly uptake, I think mean, for, for us scholars more than 800 Google scholar hits is pretty good, 
uh, but not too much uptake among practitioners. And so the puzzle here is that here is a concept that is all about uptake, all about usability, all about actionability, but it hasn't really been taken up by practitioners. I've been looking for cases for 10 years uh, since the book came out, and it's really remarkably hard to find uh, uptake among practitioners. And in the case of the Mexican government's transparency policy, they require government agencies to pursue what they call transparencia focalizada, a, a, a fine literal translation, but they use this term to mean just useful information, like where to find the lost and found office at the airport. So this is hardly an accountability tool. And then the term whistleblowers. Now, whistleblowers is interesting. Uh, it's another case of a difficult to translate term, especially because of its very negative uh, of valence or connotations in, in Spanish, or, and in German at least, possibly in other languages. But I think here it's useful to remember that this term was invented politically in English as well in the early 1970s. For many years beforehand, uh, since the 19th century, it referred to a, a sports referee who had run up and down the side of the field, or a, a kind of night watch person or, uh, who would uh, be a, a, a cop on the beat, who would, whose only uh, tool may be a, a whistle. Uh, and one of the first usages with a political connotation that has been discovered was in 1969, referring to the citizen soldier who wrote to Congress, exposing in great detail the infamous My Lai massacre. And uh, today he is remembered with the Ridenour Truth Teller Prizes. And these prizes are actually being awarded today in Washington. The, the Right to Know community is, is gathering to honor a series of whistleblowers and, and truth tellers of various kinds. One of the uh, winners today is the mayor of San Juan, who uh, pushed back and revealed the failure of, of federal support uh, and the uh, uh, bias in the way in which the federal government deals with disasters. Houston gets all the possible support in the world after their hurricane. Uh, Puerto Rico still has hundreds of thousands of people without power. And this accountability lab describes this strategy of lifting up uh, truth tellers uh, and, and positive examples of public servants as, as naming and faming. And uh, Blair is here today. You can talk to him more about that. And this actually, well, the issue of whistleblowing raises questions about the, the, the issue, the role of evidence. And, what kind of data are we talking about? And I think it's important to acknowledge that there are a whole range of ways of communicating causal stories about accountability issues. D telling stories with data is just one, and that scientific criteria are not the only criteria to use. There's this whole other world of, of truth-telling that can reveal uh, what would be otherwise invisible patterns. And so I think uh, what we could call the Sherlock Holmes approach, the, fit, the trying to figure out uh, how the story fits together with means, method, and opportunity, uh, the, the, the role of discovering uh, the smoking gun, the role of finding those insiders who already know how the data is connected is something that uh, needs to be valued and, uh, more widely in our field. And then open washing. Open washing is a term that has uh, been promoted uh, by some of us relatively recently through experience with the Open Government Partnership. And uh, together with Rosie McGee, we had a very interesting conversation at one of the early global summits of the OGP in London when we served on, on the, the founding technical committee for the independent reporting mechanism. And we, what we were seeing, seeing led us to the conclusion that this really needs to be named, this phenomenon. Uh, needs to be named, and there turns out there are a variety of, of definitions. That, uh, in one community, talks about spinning openness even though it's not there. But another term, another, another definition rather, involves uh, actual openness, open government policies. There might actually be some transparency, but that transparency serves to cover up uh, a lack of accountability or persistent impunity. One interesting case that, that was revealed recently is the term testifying, which is a combination of testifying and lying. This term refers to police testimony uh, regarding uh, uh, charges that, of police abuse, police violence. And uh, this term's been around for 25 years, but there's, a recent, there's been a recent new twist on it in the case of the use of of, of a technical solution to the problem of police violence, the solution of police cameras. Uh, I, I wonder whether or not the use of police cameras is in the category of, of civic tech or not, the, uh, particularly when they can be turned off at strategic moments. But the, uh, what, one of the things that came out recently was the, the systematic pattern, at least in New York, where uh, the police lies would be fully revealed by the video testimony, but nevertheless, they would get away with it partly because of the pressure to resolve cases before they come to trial so they don't actually have to testify. But basically we find a case where an attempt to use openness 
uh, to use transparency, the, the documentation and revelation of police behavior, has not managed to end impunity. So if we just flip back to the open government partnership, we have uh, examples from Guatemala, Romania, and Azerbaijan. Uh, and the Guatemala case is particularly notable because the, the senior government official in charge of the open government partnership and the construction sector transparency and initiative and the extractive industries transparency initiative was led away in handcuffs because uh, she was discovered to be part of a uh, government corruption plot that also reached the president. So if the, if the senior most official in charge of these uh, governance multi-stakeholder initiatives is herself guilty of corruption, I think it would be safe to say that openness was being used to cover up corruption. Uh, now, this raises a definitional challenge, though, because uh, the, the use of open washing as a term is kind of handy as an epithet, just as uh, green washing is a handy epithet, but it, it turns out that it's much harder to define in practice than one might think. And I've been working on this with, uh, with a colleague, uh, Brandon Brockmeyer, and the question is, does it refer to essentially the mere appearance of transparency or fake transparency that coexists with accountability failures, or does it uh, uh, refer to more proactive, intentional, deliberate attempts to cover up impunity with transparency, and they're not the same thing. One reason why they're not the same thing is you can imagine a, a government composed of diverse political forces where one faction within the government is able to pursue transparency reforms, uh, perhaps with international allies, while other factions of the government, perhaps the dominant faction of the government, uh, continues to uh, act with, with impunity. And that uh, is a matter of the balance of power within the state. But in that context, it's, it's hard to say that the transparency reforms were uh, promoted with the intent to cover up, but rather it reflects uh, a, a contested balance of power within the state. So really, the, one of the challenges is, how, does, should the definition include the intent to deceive, which is very hard to demonstrate, or is it enough for that concept to refer to the combination of some transparency with a persistent lack of accountability. And the Mexican case is really prominent here because Mexico ranks number one by the most uh, reliable uh, rating of uh, public information access systems. Uh, it's really quite a remarkable law. There's still a fairly robust uh, and somewhat autonomous agency that, that uh, applies the law. But at the same time, Mexico ranks quite low on Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index and has actually dropped five or six points just in the last few years. And if anyone follows the Mexican press, you know that there are, there's uh, almost 20 governors who are either in jail, on the run, uh, who have been uh, widely documented to be corrupt. The government accountability agency finds massive corruption and nothing happens. Their charges get filed away by the, uh, the system of justice. And one of the uh, most recent changes in Mexico is that they had the one of the most advanced, let's say, uh, from the point of view of civil society government power sharing, one of the most advanced multi-stakeholder bodies called the Tripartite Secretariat to carry out the open government partnership. But it was discovered that the government had bought a spyware from, uh, uh, from an Israeli company and had used that spyware on a whole range of civil society activists. And, and not just activists who were challenging uh, the government directly, but activists who were working on causes like anti-obesity campaigns. Apparently, uh, pursuing ta the taxation of soft drinks is considered quite threatening to the government. And they looked after these uh, quite pro-business civil society activists as well. And this led the civil society coalition very politically politically diverse to leave the OGP process, leaving the government hanging. So, so in the context of OGP, Me Mexico went from being one of the most uh, sort of cutting edge uh, reformers to being uh, one of the most retrograde. And what this suggests is that the, the Mexican experience suggests that, that it's not just that it's hard for transparency to lead to accountability, it suggests that these arrows are now pointing in opposite directions. This is a paradigm case of how you can have a fairly legally and institutionally established uh, public information access reforms at the same time as you have a quite uh, entrenched and intractable uh, s institutions of impunity. And then uh, one, of the, one of the last terms is sandwich strategies. And sandwich strategies, uh, it tries to capture the synergy between reformers both in state and society. Uh, it involves uh, virtuous circles of state society 
coalitions that, that try to empower each other. It starts with the, with the uh, point of departure that, that uh, genuine pro-accountability actors in the state are weak, that genuine pro-accountability actors in society are weak, but by coming together they can empower each other and begin to shift the balance of forces. And I first put this idea out uh, in a book in 1992, and essentially it didn't get any traction whatsoever. It's been, it was, it was uh, lost to history. Uh, I gave up on that. That was before I realized that I'd kind of buried the lead uh, in the book. But it turns out that a colleague in the Philippines, June Boras, uh, used this term in cross-cultural context. He adapted the context of a sandwich, uh, shed its inherent Western bias, and talked about the bibinka strategy, which is a rice cake in the Philippines that is simultaneously heated from above and below. And if you Google bibinka, you'll see pictures of actual uh, rice cakes, uh, but this one is the cover of his book. And one of the remarkable things is here the term actually did get uptake in the Philippines. Uh, based on um, uh, my experience with Filipino colleagues, they, they tell me that the term is still widely used in the Philippines, but its, use, its, word, its meaning has been watered down. Originally, it referred to a convergence of forces between real pressure from below, grassroots movements pushing for the implementation of agrarian reform, uh, sympathetic uh, technocrats in the system who are willing to stick their neck out and promote uh, implementation to really invest their political capital in pressuring the apparatus to deliver on the government's promises. Uh, and so it involved taking into account the productive role of conflict, uh, where you had a state society coalition in conflict in favor of accountability, pushing back against state society coalitions that opposed accountability. But today, the term has been watered down to simply meaning state society coalitions, which, using the term constructive engagement, essentially means that the civil society partners in that coalition are expected to not engage in any uh, adversarial approaches whatsoever. They're, they're, they're assumed to uh, uh, provide unconditional loyalty. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a mixed story. So the takeaways today are that accountability strategies face the challenge of communicating more effectively. Uh, we, and the issue here is not only how to govern better, how to improve, let's say, government responsiveness, but we're really in a position of needing to push back uh, much more proactively to defend rights and democracy against the challenges. And so I think we really uh, need to... Uh, to unleash our creativity to think more about how, how can we come up with, with terms that can really have more potential to go viral. Uh, and that to go viral not only in, uh, in cyberspace, but also to go f viral among the, the more grounded and grassroots constituencies that, uh, whose, whose power is going to be so important to uh, defend rights. And so there, I'm, gonna, I'm proposing here just to wrap up two approaches that are especially relevant, uh, and I've mentioned some examples today. Uh, the first is how to repurpose existing terms like whistleblower to communicate and accountability initiatives more effectively. And the next one is how to invent new terms that actually are grounded, that make sense to people where they're at. And so just to sum up, I think we, uh, we can say that accountability keywords are both contested terrain and terrain worth contesting. Thank you. How are we doing on time? Please. Please. And um, thank you. That was both fun and extremely interesting. And one um, thought that struck me, which is about the open washing um, slide, literally, but I think pertains to the broader conversation, was I think there's a, a causal story perhaps missing in it, which is that I think part of what Many of us, and I said, sorry, I should, I'm Karen Christensen, I'm chair of Open Knowledge, but I am also, for my sins, a former politician, um, is the, the, we are using weak transparency initiatives to actually try and engage with and counter lack of accountability. And I think that is one of the, the missing causal stories in this that I think is it's certainly the, the way I have attempted to use them, and I suspect many people in this room do, but I do think that actually reflects on some of the broader issues in this as well. Thanks. Other comments? Rosie? Yeah. Hello, I'm Rosie McGee from IDS in the UK, oops, uh, formerly of Making All Voices Count. Um, I was just interested to see on your last slide about um, repurposing terms and coining new terms, 
you didn't mention reclaiming old terms. And I struggle with this one a lot because as somebody who comes out of the participation discourse and practices of sort of 15 years ago and more, um, I think there's a lot that needs to be reclaimed about notions of participation and citizen engagement and a broadening of the notion of participation to also include um, contestation, not just co-optation type participation. So I was just wondering what you, what you say on that. Thanks, that's a great point, yeah. I'm back. Um, hi, my name is uh, Christian Medina. I'm from Open North in Montreal, Canada. Uh, my, my question was regarding uh, translation of different terms. Um, so you've you pointed out that that a lot of the times it originates in English and then translates to a different term, or we try to translate to a different term. <laughs> But have you seen evidence or more evidence of it originating in a non-English language and translating to English? Like from my own experience in Colombia, I know a lot of concepts regarding corruption are very creative in Colombia. So spreading the marmalade means a certain kind of corruption related to clientelism, whilst being a crocodile, la garteria, is more related to top-down clientelism. No, that's that's a great point. There, there are many other terms in Spanish, cuentas claras, quien paga manda, that are part of an accountability discourse that is that is left out by those who, who simply stop at saying, well, there isn't a good exact translation for accountability, and and therefore there's a great blog if those for those who are interested in the global accountability blog, uh, which talks about, which starts off by uh, quoting uh, an English professor who announced that there is no term for transparency in Swahili, and therefore the concept doesn't exist. Well, it turns out the term does exist in Swahili. The person who claimed that doesn't speak Swahili. And then it turns out that, uh, that just because it, it, it may not exist doesn't mean the, the, if the term doesn't exist, doesn't mean the concept doesn't exist. And the blog goes on to argue that, well, we didn't have a term for television before television existed, but we don't really have any trouble uh, understanding the concept now that it exists. So, yeah. And back. Thank you. My, my name is Stefan Verhulst, uh, GovLab. So my question is related to what George Lakoff has worked on, which is really about the power of framing, which ultimately is about each word means different things to different people with different value sets. And so if you want to be powerful with regard to a, a specific word, you have to realize that, for instance, in the US, Democrats will react differently to certain words than Republicans. And so how do you take the power of framing into account when you assess um, terms like accountability? Well, this is all about framing. In fact, I originally had a slide that talked about, well, people used to say the medium is the message and maybe framing is the message. So this is, this is all about framing and, and the causal stories argument is, is all about framing. So uh, thank you for that. In front. Oh. Uh, I'm playing a demo from uh, making my voice has count previously, uh, but now an independent researcher in Malawi. Uh, on the sandwich strategy, I kind of get struck with the, the changing nature of that sandwich, given the context, contextual dynamics, which produces movements of actors from one side to the other. Say, for instance, change of, you know, after elections, maybe. Uh, you know, an opposition party has gone into power, it will certainly shift some actors who are in government now go into civil society. And I think that also either can, can downscale in the way you were advocating or it can, it can push it up. So I think those movements are important to watch uh, because those movements of actors, some who were activists in civil society, when they are now in the state, they don't become they don't retain the activism they had in civil society. Somehow, they are for, you know, uh, uh, faced with other new challenges or incentives. So I think the sandwich, its nature and the way it moves along has a lot to do with those contextual dynamics as well. And that also has effects on what would, one would call weak accountability or, or other terms that one might use. So it's, uh, to me, I think we need to factor that into the equation. That's, uh, that's a really great point. And in the, in the Philippines, that process is referred to crossovers. Under the previous government, the Aquino government, there were many uh, uh, CSO leaders who joined uh, the, the liberal government. And uh, they turned out to be uh, 
not very helpful allies to, to civil society organizations. They basically expected unconditional loyalty based on their past track record and uh, the, the result was uh, not very productive and uh, they took uh, a lot of things for granted in, in a way that a lot of, sort of liberal technocrats around the world took way too much for granted and we're now paying the price. I should say that in terms of the, the definition of reformers in this approach, uh, it, there's a fairly precise definition. It does not refer to those who have certain intentions, it does not refer to those who are uh, saying the right things, it refers to only those cases where uh, reformists within the state manage to get their hands on the actual levers of, uh, of, 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 of agencies that are able to deliver tangible forms of support or enabling environments to make uh, collective action uh, more viable and less risky. Uh, in other words, if reformers are not able to uh, reduce the threat of reprisals, for collective action, then they're not really delivering to civil society. So it's a, it's a fairly bounded understanding of what counts as a reformer. Otherwise, uh, we, we miss the distinction between those who just talk the talk and those who walk the walk. Hi, uh, Emily Shaw Gavex. I really enjoyed this a lot. It got me thinking about lots of things. Uh, among them, uh, one of your early slides talked about downward versus upward accountability. Um, and it made me think about the constituencies we're talking about. Um, one important constituency here is powerful people uh, versus you know, the folks outside of CSOs, the folks you know, we think about in um, the, the Black Lives Movement, for example. Um, how does power uh, work with your system of thinking about um, who is accountable to whom. Well, this this is all about power, and, and this is about the, the essentially the need to have a power analysis I throughout the system, and not assume that that, uh, that that data speaks for itself, or that by itself information is going to drive drive change. I think that this is the subtext here is is how do we think about change strategies first in order to decide what kind of, of information or data is really going to drive it in contrast to starting with the data and then trying to figure out what can we, we can do with it. Um, hi, Chago Pichuto from World Bank. So since we're talking about terms, um, a civic tech as a term has been very uh, undefined or over broadly defined as technology for the public good. So delivering pizza over the internet could be civic tech to some extent. So uh, for you, what would make technology civic? What does the civic term means for you? Well, that would be, seems totally contextual uh, and uh, really depends on who, who's using it for what rather than uh, assuming there's something inherent uh, in, in the tool. Tools can be used for a wide range of purposes. Uh, so I think that's, that's really where we're going here and I, I look forward to learning more in the next couple of days about the different ways in which the tools are, are being used and, and what does it take to deploy them strategically. So. Just in front here, yeah. Yeah, hi, Zach Brisson from Reboot. Thanks, Jonathan, this was really interesting but it actually left me a little pessimistic. So I'm kind of wondering, as you were unpacking the challenges of using language it reminds me you know the curse of Babel right C can we ever actually overcome this issue where language is interpreted differently in different contexts per what Stefan was saying or is there a possible future where we might need to think about ways to not rely on framing or, or specific words to still drive this work forward well, I think not relying on framing would let others do the framing and that's one reason why we're, we're losing uh, I mean, uh, in, in many cases, losing, losing control of the terms of debate. Uh, I think the, really the, the challenge that I'm posing is how do we be very proactive and mindful about trying to influence the terms of debate, the, the, the terms that, that lift up some issues rather than others, that, that point fingers in some directions rather than others. Uh, and I think that's, uh, I think it would be, uh, you know, while it, while it, it it's depressing because it, we're on the defensive. I think any, any other stance would be uh, unhelpfully unrealistic uh, because that's the reality that, that we're facing. And it's really time to uh, think about strategies to push back uh, rather than hoping the, the data will speak for itself. Uh, 
Thank you. Michael Meyer-Resende from Democracy Reporting International. We are an NGO working in many countries. I would like to follow up on the question on framing and lack of what I found most interesting in this whole lack of approach that he made very clear. This is not just a tactical choosing of the right words and then everything is fine, but that he said that it's a reflection of our deepest beliefs. And you know, you said we we are in the defensive and many of these terms are very contested now and I agree with that and I often have the feeling that we also have to cl clarify again for ourselves what we stand for. You know, we take for self-evident we all like democracy, human rights, a better wor world, but then we talk to other people who say, yeah, I love democracy and that's why I voted for Trump because he's anti-elite, that's democracy. And often we are speechless because we feel that's our term and how these people take it. But often our answers are not very rich or not very well thought through. So I feel in many ways we also need to go back and uh, be clear. You know, we are on the defense of what are, what are our front lines? What are we defending actually? And I would like to hear from you if you also feel that it's this fundamental question often now of what do we stand for? So all this um, framing and finding the right notions is good, but often we maybe suffer because it's not clear to us anymore what exactly it is, what we mean when we say democracy, human rights, rule of law, or whatever it may be. Thanks. I think that that's really helpful because the, the focus uh, of today's talk has been how do we communicate uh, what we stand for, and you're quite right that that does imply an assumption that we already know what we stand for, and therefore it's a matter of communicating. But I think what, what an emphasis on keywords does is it looks at not only how does the, how does the term influence the debate, but it, well, we also need to think about how does the debate influence uh, you know what what the what terms we we choose and, and lift up. So so yes, it's it's time to go back to to first principles, particularly when when so many of the terms have either been uh, slipped from our grasp or have been watered down, uh, but in so many different ways. And that's that's. Uh, sometimes the the uh, the price of success, in other words, the the, the incredible takeoff of the the value of, of transparency uh, uh, compared to 20 years ago, uh, has come with with the risk of being watered down and distorted. So, when the more optimistic view would be to say that's the price of success at at uh, projecting uh, a, a term or a value into the global discourse, uh, and we need to I think take more more proactive measures to to address the, the threat of, of hijacking and watering down. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. It's been really interesting. My name is Mivan. I work at Full Fact. It's a fact-checking charity. Um, one of the examples you gave of a weaponized term was fake news, and something that we're doing in the fact-checking community is trying to explain that there's a lot of complexity in this term fake news, and actually it's lots of different types, and these different types have different motivations, and then they have different distribution mechanisms, and picking any one of these combinations results in a different solution. And I think that all of the terms we're kind of talking about all have this buried complexity in them, like you say, on accountability, on transparency. So if we're trying to reclaim these words or frame them in a particular way that is most valuable to talk about, we have to start digging into that complexity. And then the question becomes, how do you dig into complexity at that kind of granular level and communicate that in a way that is meaningful when actually it's really hard? Um, I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. That's a really good point. Some of the the, the attempts to address fake news, at least in the U.S., have been quite limited because they only focus on obviously invented uh, sources, you know, kind of you know, fake you know, websites and bots and so forth. And they don't address the penetration of fake news into the mainstream media. So, you know, the fact that, that, that Fox News itself is, a, is the primary source of fake news is excluded from the definition of fake news by some of those initiatives. So that's a huge, huge problem. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the, I, I, one hypothesis is that that, firm was, that term was first deployed in the U.S. context during the campaign as, as an attempt to push back from Trump. I, I haven't done the research to really document that. That's the impression I had from the, from the campaign. Uh, and then it was, it was lost to us. Uh, and I think uh, one of the, the, the challenges there is to be more forthright in calling out the, 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 the mainstream media that, that is independent, that does represent the fourth estate uh, in the US, uh, was very reluctant to uh, call out 
lies as lies. It was, a big, it, was, it was big news when they started to say that a statement by Trump or one of his allies was false. There was a, essentially a lag of at least six months. Uh, it wasn't until well after the election that lies were called lies. And I think that was a, a huge missed opportunity uh, to, uh, to challenge the, uh, the, that, that phenomenon. So. Thank you for letting me have a second go. Um, this is a really brilliant input to, for starting off the Tech Tech conference. Two years ago at the Tech Tech conference in Barcelona, which was one of my first bits of adventuring as a sort of anthropologist, social scientist into the world of data scientists and technologists, in my presentation I really wanted to use the term epistemology and the term paradigms, and I didn't dare because I thought that we would all be talking past each other if I did. But I think what's happened in the world in the last two years, and lots of the things that have been said in the presentation this morning, are a call to all of us to go think about that, because what truth is, and what fact is, and what opinion is, is a completely different thing depending on what epistemological paradigm you're sitting within and working within. And my perception then was, you know, this world of people that I didn't know very well was sitting within one, and because almost everybody within it was sitting within that one, the paradigms were invisible, they were part of the wallpaper. And, and people weren't aware of them. But an awful lot of what's coming up here, when you said, Jonathan, about how much framing and meanings matter, not just to academics, absolutely. I mean, they're what, they're what give the meaning or take away the meaning to the work of data science and technology, the use of technology in fields like governance. So I really hope that this can kind of start us off to an, an epistemologically aware kind of debate throughout the conference. It would be brilliant. You know, paradigm is an interesting case of a term that went viral among academics. So it starts in reference to scientific revolutions, and then it becomes applied to by academics to to a whole range of other uh, fields. But I, don't, I think it would be hard to say that it went viral outside of academia, and that's where causal story might be a, a handier term. It's a little bit more intuitive. We've so. got time for one more question. Yeah, <clears throat> I just want to say that in this space, I think that it takes courage to not only choose the word, but define what you mean by the word that you use. And in order to, in, the, in this space that we are trying to take moral and ethical stands in spaces where there aren't structural incentives to do so, it takes courage to put a moral or ethical value in the word that you use, and we need to continue to do that. Very good, thank you very much. <laughs>